Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting. It's been a busy last few weeks. We've had many modules and also did the final Metasploit town hall installment at the final DerbyCon. Hey. That, was, that was exciting. Whew. Let's hop in. In a bonus slide, we have a bonus slide this week. Uh, if you missed the news from the Metasploit Town Hall at DerbyCon last week, the GitHub pull request for the Metasploit Blue Peep module is up. It targets 64-bit Windows 7 and server 2008 R2. Default behavior is to identify the target OS and if it is decide if it is likely vulnerable, actual target selection is manual. This was a true community effort, many hours spread across many people around the world. We really appreciate everyone who pitched in to make this happen, super cool. Our own Brent Cook did a nice write-up about things BlueKeep, which includes a, quite a bit of information on detection and mitigation for blue teams in addition to exploitation notes. You can read it alongside our Metasploit wrap-ups at blog.rapid7.com. And as always, a huge thanks to everyone who helps make Metasploit better through their contributions. Thank you very much. How about some demos? Yes, please. All right, Mr. Brendan. So I'm demoing, uh, there are two privilege escalations on pretty late or pretty recent versions of Windows 10. Uh, it's kind of a funny story how it came about. We had uh, Tim Wright, who is one of our contributors and is super awesome, submitted, a, uh, submitted one of them. And when I was going through it, it didn't work. So I started doing research on the uh, wsreset.exe, which is a Windows store executable that goes and clears caches. Uh, WSreset.exe has an auto elevate uh, built into it. And when I went through and read it, it didn't seem to follow, uh, Tim's exploit didn't seem to follow any of the documentation that I had read. And after a while, I figured out that WSreset.exe didn't have one uh, problem in it, it had two. It has both a DLL hijacking vulnerability in it and a registry hijacking vulnerability against it. So uh, Tim and I worked together. We put, split our two uh, modules apart, and so I was going to dem demonstrate both of them. In this particular case, I've got uh, a regular session on Windows 10, 17.13.4, uh, which is uh, 18.03, so it's a fairly recent. Uh, and... There's nothing up my sleeve. I can't run get system. So background. The first one we're going to demonstrate is the registry uh, overwrite because that's a very straightforward vulnerability. Um, there's not much to set in this. And I believe it was session four. 
Maybe if I spelled session right. I will switch over one catch with using these is that you get a giant uh, wsreset.exe uh, pop-up on the remote host. So be aware there are artifacts. It then goes away. We get our session. And we're now system. All right. Cool. Now, that's a fairly straightforward. All we do is we upload an executable somewhere on the machine. We overwrite a low privileged uh, registry entry. And after elevation, wsreset.exe launches whatever is in that registry location. The other uh, The other actually combines two interesting vulnerabilities uh, to this. And one of them is that the wsreset.exe is vulnerable to a DLL hijacking. Whenever you launch it, it automatically looks in whatever folder it is in and launches propsys.dll. The fun thing about it is that auto elevate relies on several things to work. One of them is the binary must be signed. So wsreset.exe WS is signed, and it must be running from a trusted location. This means you can't simply dump uh, that propsys DLL file into the folder that wsreset is in. But interestingly enough, the verification process for a trusted folder isn't watertight. And so one of the things that this exploit or this module does is it creates a C Windows space system32 folder, which passes those checks. So Notice here it's creating that directory, C Windows space. It then copies uh, WS reset to that, the Windows space system32 folder, and then uploads our uh, payload as propsys.dll, and then we get our callback. Our system again. The catch with this one is that that window stays open. So be careful using this particular one. And the other thing is, uh, notice when we do, we have two Windows folders now. <laughs> okay, any questions on that? That's pretty neat. Uh, do you think that the you know, the uh, extra space in a phantom Windows folder could be used for um, DLL bypasses and a lot of other software as well. Do you have any kind of ideas for techniques for identifying what software might be vulnerable to that kind of uh, uh, attempt? Yes, this is actually, uh, the. there are a couple of write-ups on using this technique to bypass various forms of this DLL hijacking to avoid, to, to get through that uh, trusted uh, auto-elevate feature. The biggest problem is there is almost no way that I have found to delete that Windows space folder. <laughs> Interesting. So you'd have to use like the API or, or some sort of um, like a sim link or some other kind of way to reference that folder. Right. Uh, and, uh, and notice it shows up as being the exact same as the original. So there is something going on in the background that is making the Windows file system very unhappy when you use this technique. Yeah, it's even got the same creation date or modification date. That's amazing. And size and <laughs> yeah. So, so when, when this vulnerability was fixed, was it just simply fixed in the, um, was it fixed in the file system or was it fixed in the, um, in the so that's an awesome question because uh, from the best I can tell, this was not uh, 
Microsoft's response team did not say this was a bug. There is no CVE to this. This isn't a vulnerability. Uh, instead, they released a, uh, excuse me for a moment, I have a meeting. Um, <laughs> the, uh, they released a uh, signature for it for Windows Defender. They didn't patch it. But apparently it doesn't work in later versions of Windows. But the, the ver these versions, uh, 1803 and 1809, are supposed to be vulnerable to both of these. And in theory, they're not being patched. OK. Oh. Fascinating. Thank you. No worries. Thanks, Brennan. Yeah, thanks, Brennan. Super cool. All right. Let's see. I'm going to see if I can usurp it real quick just to give the slides. All right. Here's the demo everybody's been waiting for. Okay. I think. Maybe. You're going to get it whether you're waiting for it or not. Blue Key with Brent. Hopefully I didn't make it wait too long. There you go. Thank you, Brent. All right. Um, so thanks for everybody. Um, so I'm going to be demonstrating the um, exploit module that we have in the pull request queue right now for CVE 2019-0708, also known as Blue Key. Um, this is a module that, um, you know, as, as we mentioned earlier, is a community effort. Um, uh, zero sum uh, gave us kind of the initial, shared with us initial POC, which is actually pretty nifty. It used uh, the, the Python external module support to, to integrate with Metasploit uh, kind of directly with some, some external libraries. Um, one thing to kind of note about this Metasploit module here is that um, it's one of our first modules that can actually build kernel level shellcode on the fly. Um, it's kind of a little, little new, neat feature that we added um, to make other kinds of kernel exploitation simpler in the future. Um, but I'll, I'll walk you through, through that a little bit. But first of all, let's talk a little bit about the vulnerability. Now, the vulnerability um, uh, you know, was, was basically publicized about, about four months ago or so. Um, there was basically a use after free in the um, RDP services of uh, many different versions of Windows where basically an internal channel, a channel being a, a way that different kinds of data is passed between the client and the, um, uh, the RDP server. So for instance, audio, uh, graphics, uh, your clipboard, all those kinds of things are, are different channels. So there's an internal channel that accidentally allowed uh, external users to use it, um, external clients to use it. And um, when you disconnect it from this channel, if you send a, a malformed disconnect message, um, it would basically cause a user after free vulnerability. So effectively, um, uh, you as an attacker could, um, could sort of change what um, data would, would, would be pointed to at some point within the disconnect process. So that basically means the vulnerability is triggered on disconnect. Um, if you can get shellcode sprayed into a sort of predictable location within the operating system, um, then you can basically leverage this user after free vulnerability to get um, indirect calls, um, through a specific gadget within the, the disconnect code and um, execute code arbitrarily. Now, one of the tricks to this vulnerability have been for a long time figuring out how do I get the code in place to actually run? How do I predict where it needs to be and how do I sort of get that uploaded? Because there, there's nothing directly that lets you do that. Um, the way that this module works is it actually um, attempts to sort of spray the non-page pool with a, a basically, and again, a non-page pool is a section of memory within Windows that um, basically doesn't get swapped to disk. So it's at a predictable location, it never goes away. So which is where you want for shellcode. One of the tricks is that the location of the non-page pool on newer versions of Windows is randomly allocated. So it's all over the place. And that's a, that's a intended, that's a security measure. Older versions of Windows, uh, like Windows 7, Windows 2008 R2, they actually um, have it in a fixed location from reboot to reboot but it's at a different offset depending on other characteristics of the host operating environment. For instance, if it's running in a virtualization and um, it's a container, um, what kind of hardware it is, that sort of thing, how much memory you have, can you even change where the non-page pool is. Um, so there's a lot of different variables that um, at least this module today isn't able to determine on the fly. Um, I'll show you a little bit about how the usage of the module works and um, kind of some, some tricks to being successful with the modules today. Um, let's go ahead and take a look. So this is the information screen for the module. There's not a whole lot that you have to set. You can basically set the target IP address. Um, if we do show options, um, we can see that um, you can, of course, just set a normal payload. Uh, the module today supports a number of targets. Let's show the targets. And you'll see a little bit more of what I mean as far as like how specific the targets actually are. Um, with the initial module pull request, we have um, basically four different targets. One that targets generic hardware. Um, 
three targets for different virtualized environments as well. Although we found that also, for instance, VMware 15 and VMware 14 have different non-page pool offsets. Um, so there have been some community contributions for, for different kinds of operating environments. Um, we also had someone who verified that this exploit works in AWS, which is, uh, again, a different kind of hypervisor um, based on Zen. And um, that, of course, requires different offsets as well. If we run the check command with the module, you'll see here that um, it actually leverages the existing Bluekey check auxiliary scanner module under the covers. Um, in fact, the way it messed with sort of indicating that right now, it's not intentional, but that's how it's doing it, is adding an extra space to saying I shelled out to a different module to, to do the check. Um, with the pull request, we added some, some kind of neat things um, in that um, Metasploit can actually check to see what version of the kernel is installed, but it can't tell, for instance, if you're running Windows Server or you're running Windows 7. The reason why this is important is um, the groom channel. Um, if we were to type edit on the module, you actually hear, see here a few of the notes that are built into um, you know, our, our, our documentation to kind of tell you things to watch out for. Um, if you look at the top here, it notes that um, the way that we actually inject the shellcode is over the, the sound channel, the RDP sound channel. Now, the sound channel is actually disabled um, on Windows Server 2008. So you have to actually undisable the sound channel currently to get the, uh, the groom code in. Now, there are some, um, some techniques that have been published for other ways to getting data into the kernel, and we may explore these kind of in the future. But for right now, this is kind of a list of to-dos to, to implement within, within the module. Um, so again, so what I showed you here is that the check option works. Um, let's go ahead and run the module and sort of give you an idea of what it does by default. Because the user is required to um, target the module more specifically, uh, the module actually will bail out, we'll do a check and we'll say that it, it aborted due to a non-existing configuration. You basically need to set the right target manually. So let's go ahead and do that. Because my targets are running on VirtualBox, I'm gonna say set target two, which is the VirtualBox channel or virtual box target, and let's go ahead and run it. What this space is going to do is it's going to actually target each, each of the target operating systems one by one. Um, I use the Metasploit 5 R hosts command to, uh, to make sure that uh, you know, it targets everything as sort of a batch. Um, what it's done first is it checked to see if all the channels that we need to exploit are available. And the second thing it did was it actually injected all the shell code. And then finally it did the disconnect, which did the use after free, which then jumps into the shell code and then loads the interpreter. Um, there's a lot of documentation inside the module exact, exactly how that works, but it's basically exactly the same as Edmund 17010's um, kernel shell code, the user space uh, jump um, that was originally pioneered by uh, Sleepia as part of his um, eternal blue module. Um, so you see here that we actually ran this module against two different target OSs if I type sessions. Um, you can see a verify that I now have two sessions against two different hosts. Um, if I run, go ahead and run sessions, I believe dash capital C sysinfo, I can actually run sysinfo against each one of them and show that I have a Windows 7 uh, server spec one shell and I have a Windows server R2 shell. Um, go ahead and do a get UID. I can verify that we're all running a system already. No privilege escalation needed because we went from kernel straight into the privilege escalation uh, into the user space. Uh, one other thing to note is that um, because this uh, needs to basically be a sub-process of an existing um, a process within the user space, um, we actually currently hang it off the, the principaler, which is the same as M1701. This could be modified, um, but that's a pretty reliable target. Um, if it crashes, it always comes back. That's one reason why a lot of times people prefer it. If you're looking for IOCs, that's something to look for. It's basically processes hanging off the principaler are definitely something <laughs> that should be viewed as suspicious. Now, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the only way that this model could work in the future. And so obviously detecting the techniques and of course patching your servers um, is obviously the best solution in these particular cases. Um, so that's it. Any questions on the Bluegate model for right now? Excellent.